new choices, new players, new models of care. You know consumer first healthcare is everywhere. For us to build the future, to see what's new, we gotta look at the world from a different point of view. Consumer innovation ain't going away. I say it's here to stay, today it leads the way. We gotta drop the silos, we're all the same team. Experience, business, tech, and marketing. So join us now, join the revolution. Consumer first health is the evolution. Status quo, or like status, no. Yeah, this is the healthcare rep. Yo, come on, let's go. Welcome back to the leading podcast about consumer innovation. I'm Jared Johnson, and here's what's going to go down today. We have the flavor of the week about Deidre Kramer's presentation on consumer strategy at the Healthcare Marketing 360 conference. How do we champion the need for better consumer experiences so that we can set better standards for meeting their expectations? I'll talk about that. Then we welcome Paul Markovich, president and CEO at Blue Shield of California. It's been close to six months since Blue Shield of California made a big splash by announcing that they were tapping Amazon and Mark Cuban's Cost Plus drugs for their pharmacy network. So we're going to chat about what's happened since then and what it means for members receiving care. Get ready for some disruptive thinking, y'all. It's time to dive right in. Are you ready? Let's go. Flavor of the Week. What progress can we expect to see as we lead the charge to prioritize consumers' needs in the design process? Last week, I spoke about Denise Worrell's presentation at Healthcare Marketing 360 and how we were intentional about including human-centered design and consumer experience as themes of the event. Another highlight was Deidre Kramer's presentation titled Developing a Strategy to Meet the Modern Consumer's Expectations. Deidre is the Vice President of Consumer Strategy for Sutter Health and what we consider a consumer experience champion. Her presentation emphasized how consumer insights, experience, experience, and engagement are keys to transforming the current state of healthcare. Deidre highlighted the mandate for healthcare organizations to transform in order to survive and thrive in this world of digital connectivity, transparency, and instant gratification. She said in order to be successful, healthcare organizations must create consumer strategies that do three things. First, glean consumer insights and put the voice of the consumer at the center. Second, build intentional platforms and advanced digital experiences to meet the modern consumer's expectations. And third, create consistent, frictionless, consumer Consumer first in person experiences. We want to think like disruptors who put the voice of the consumer at the center of everything they do. We want to build advanced digital consumer experiences that enhance patients' ability to interact and transact. And we want to own consumers' journeys like how disruptors engage the consumer end to end and through the last mile. It was a great presentation and it reminded me of three important lessons here. First, the debate with clinicians to understand why we refer to people as consumers remains ongoing, though hopefully there are fewer times when physicians want to throw marketers out of the room. Second, the consumer function is key to truly transforming in order to address these challenges. The best approach seems to be a self-standing consumer vertical, but it can also live within digital innovation, patient experience, and or marketing. The point is, find the champions within your organization and start somewhere if you haven't already. And third, as I've said many times, the typical hospital provider insurance-based system was not designed with very many human-centered needs in mind. So a key to moving forward is accepting that fact so that we don't get bogged down in why things were built a certain way in the past. We have to be squarely focused on the reality of right now. Is there a lot to do? Yes. Is it daunting? I don't think it has to be. As consumer experience champions continue to wave their flag, connect with each other, and share best practices, we'll keep making incremental progress that builds until we can look back one day and see how far we've come. Just like we've done with every step along the way to digital transformation and every other evolution that came before it. We each play a part in that, including you, my friend. Let's continue to stand at the front lines and champion the need for better consumer experiences so we can set better standards for meeting the needs and expectations of the people we serve. That's another way that we'll build the healthcare of tomorrow, and that's the flavor of the week. The flow, the flow. All right, let's get into the flow. Today, we're honored to welcome Paul Markovich. He's the president and CEO at Blue Shield of California. You know, it's been close to six months since Blue Shield of California made a big splash. They announced that they were tapping Amazon and Mark Cuban's Cost Plus drugs for its pharmacy network. So we're going to chat about what's happened since then and what it means for members receiving care. And I've got to say, one thing I really respect about Paul is that he doesn't just tell people to be more active. He shows it. So whether it's his first tennis match in 10 years or a planking challenge 
with team members on LinkedIn. I love that he's unafraid to lead by example. So let's get right into it. Paul, welcome to the Healthcare Wrap. Jared, thanks for having me. And I mean that about the fitness challenges and things I see. It's refreshing to see that in my LinkedIn feed from time to time. Yeah, I'm willing to get myself, well, maybe not humiliated, but get my butt kicked on uh, publicly. So yeah, I guess that's courage, if nothing else. It, it is. Well, they're a lot of fun. They really are. And for those who are not as familiar, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, personally and professionally. What else did I miss in your bio? Well, born and raised in North Dakota, which is probably a unique feature to my life. It also is why I have been playing hockey my entire life. I still play in, in a league here in Oakland. And so, yeah, very, I stay very physically active as a result of that, which is kind of why the communications team has got me out there taking on challenges from employees, as you mentioned, and, you know, just incredibly passionate about transforming the healthcare system. I, I the mission, the nonprofit mission of Blue Shield of California is something that is really, truly my own professional mission in life there inseparable. So I'd be a little facetious here. I, I don't know if you were, grew up and said, you know, I want to be the CEO of an organization like this. Maybe you did. So what is one of those pieces of career advice that, uh, that shaped you, maybe not necessarily to exactly where you are today, but has shaped you along the way? To me, the top one is to just find your passion. What I heard from more than one person is, if you love what you do, it won't feel like work. And that's how I feel about what I do. I mean, there are some things that definitely feel like work, but in general, I get such enjoyment and such passion out of trying to make the healthcare system better for people that it doesn't feel like work. Not everybody's going to be passionate about the same things that I am, but figuring out what really, what you really enjoy is when you get into it, you're going to pour yourself into it. You're going to give your best effort. You're, the likelihood of being successful, I think, is really high when you're doing something that you care about deeply. That's fantastic. I, I love hearing that. And again, it's always fun to, to hear about the journeys that get people to where they are today, which just bring us to Blue Shield of California. For those who aren't familiar, how do you speak about them in layman's terms? Like, What's a layperson's description of the organization and how they approach the need to innovate on behalf of their members and consumers? Well, we're a large nonprofit mission-driven health plan. And I think most people are familiar with Blue Cross Blue Shield plans across the country. We happen to be a blue plan here serving Californians. And so I think most people are familiar with what health insurance is. I do think what distinguishes us is how mission-driven we truly are. And there's a lot of nonprofits in healthcare and health plans, hospitals, et cetera. But there aren't that many of them that uh, you know, really truly define what it means to be a nonprofit, what their mission is, and pursue it with the kind of zeal and relentlessness that we do. I like to, to use the Angela Davis quote as something that I think is exemplifies who we are when she said that I'm no longer accepting the things that I cannot change. I'm changing the things that I cannot accept. And I think that is... So seeing us as a, I think most people would say, oh, it's a blue plan that provides insurance. And that's true. And I think people understand what that means. I think when you see some of the things that we do, we talked about how active we are. That's probably the thing that makes us different than a lot of nonprofits just in general, just a, a lot of healthcare companies in general. Thanks for sharing that. And, and I do think that's, that's important for people to hear what distinguishes the work here. I'm just curious, in general, what trends are in the middle of your radar screen right here? We're still near the beginning of 2024. We're not quite halfway through the year yet. What's in the middle of that radar screen for you? Oh, affordability is always there, Jared. I mean, it's just when you take a step back, we are bankrupting with healthcare costs and how they keep growing year over year and how they outpace price and wage inflation so consistently and then take up a bigger and bigger chunk of the economy, but don't necessarily at the macro level improve outcomes or improve the service experience materially for customers or make healthcare more equitable and accessible to folks. So it's a really you know, fundamentally flawed system right now that keeps that's structurally inflationary, but not increasing accountability or performance in general. To me, that's just front and center. And we're seeing that with, well, there's these post-COVID healthcare cost trends that are popping up and you're seeing reporting across the industry. And again, you know, for us, we see that as unacceptable, I think, for a lot of players. They want to spend time just explaining it as unfortunate. And so that to me, that affordability challenge and the trends that we're seeing, that's a big long-term challenge that we've had, but it's also something we're seeing 
in the short, intermediate term. And in the short term, people are starting to attribute it to different things like the weight loss and obesity and diabetes drugs that are coming out and other factors. But the fact is, this has been a long-term trend and something that um, we're going to need to figure out how to slow down or reverse if we're going to deliver the kind of value that Americans need for us to avoid the kind of fiscal calamity that we might be facing in the future. So you're referring to GLP-1s, I assume, you know, when you talk about... I, I am, yes, when I refer to those drugs. But as I said, that's just what we tend to do is we get caught up in the, the latest thing that can be increasing costs and miss the fundamental point, which is we got to figure out how to be way, way more productive, like how to spend less money and get people healthier sooner and make the system more accessible. And that's been true in general for a while. But we tend to go chase the latest thing and, and spend our, a lot of our energy on it. And I would say that's one of the one of the factors that people are pointing to that has all contributed to trend and has the possibility of contributing to trend in the short term. The term I've heard or just started kind of using is consumer innovation. And I like thinking about it from different points of view, from different organizations that can innovate on behalf of those that they're serving, those who are being cared for. What does that term consumer innovation mean to you? Well, to me, it just... I would what I love to see is have the system actually truly be consumer centered. And it's really walking in that that consumer's shoes and trying to make things as simple as possible. And you think about other parts of our life and how, for example, how self-explanatory your smartphone is. I mean, just it doesn't come with an instruction manual. You don't have to call the customer service line, generally speaking, to get the thing to work. And if you think about all this hoops you have to jump through, all the things that go wrong in the healthcare system, it's about as far away from being consumer friendly as you can imagine. So to me, if you're really truly embracing that philosophy, Jared, what you're doing is to say, well, how can I make healthcare and experiencing healthcare, any aspect of the healthcare system, as simple or as easy as picking up my smartphone and getting it to use or downloading an app or <laughs> uh, whatever it happens to be in the rest of your life. And, and that's the standard. I think when, when people are truly pursuing this in a way that they need to, that's the standard that we need to be setting. Yeah. So from the health plan perspective, what are some ways that that can happen or is happening in terms of innovating around their members' needs? Are there any examples that come to mind? Well, I do think our pharmacy effort is one example of that. But one another one that we're working on right now is I, there's been a lot of conversation about the friction and the challenges with prior authorization. But when you get to having a comprehensive real-time digital health record that combines all of the information, all the electronic medical records from physicians and hospitals and all the information from a health plan, which is what we are doing right now. In fact, uh, 50% of all of the information available for all of our members is going to be online and accessible via people's favorite device by the end of this year for Blue Shield of California members. But once you've done that, you think about things like prior authorization, which is in the headlines a lot and in the discussion a lot as a, as a point of friction. We have prior authorization for your credit cards and your debit cards, but nobody really thinks about it because you just tap or swipe and that authorization happens in a matter of seconds. And there's no reason something like that couldn't also happen in healthcare by moving to a more digital world, having things happen in real time or near real time in a much more customer friendly manner. So that's what I mean by sort of creating a standard. There's good reasons we have prior authorization in healthcare, the same reason there's good reasons there's prior authorization for your credit card and debit card. But we're literally using fax machines to resolve these things today. Whereas it could look a whole lot more like what you experience with your credit and debit card if we get this right, which we plan to do. So you mentioned pharmacy. I'd love to dig into this a little bit because this did make such a headline and such a good topic for a lot of us to think about and talk about. I think when it was first announced. So I'm referring to roughly six months ago when Blue Shield of California announced that, the, that they were tapping Amazon and Mark Cuban's cost plus drugs for its pharmacy network. Would you be able to just recap the details of the announcement first? And then sure. I'd love to hear what reactions you've seen since then. Well, what we announced is that we weren't going to be working with a pharmacy benefit manager in, in any of the classical sense. The way this, the system generally works today is health plans or employers will contract with a pharmacy benefit manager who then handles all the administration associated with, for example, processing claims and managing eligibility for pharmacy benefits, co-pays, co-insurance, 
negotiating with pharmacy manufacturers. So there's a whole series of things that pharmacy benefit managers do, and that's the typical model today. And what we said is we're not going to use that model anymore. Instead, we're going to go directly to pharmacy manufacturers. In, in today's world, there's huge number of rebates and fees. There's a very high list price for pharmacy drugs, but the actual net price that goes to the pharmacy manufacturer typically is much lower for brand branded drugs, but also sometimes for generics. And we basically said, no, we want to just get to a system where we go directly to manufacturers, negotiate a net price, and then develop a very consumer-centered, cost-effective distribution system with new players like Amazon and Mark Cuban's Cost Plus. That was what we announced, and it did create quite a stir, I think, in the industry, because I think people realized how disruptive it could be to the incumbents. I would imagine that that has only grown since then. It's always interesting to be that first one, right? To announce something like this, where the thought process, I'm sure what was just, it took so much time up until that point. We actually had designed this back in 2019. I think we would have liked to have gotten to it sooner, but this thing called COVID hit and we got a little preoccupied Mm -hmm. back. But what really stimulated this was we were looking at like these incredibly high pharmacy trends year over year over year. And they were just, they had been going on for years and we were forecasting them out ad infinitum into the future. And when we just looked at the system that was set up today, the fundamental problem is that in addition to the pharmacy benefit managers, there's probably seven other players between the the pharmacy manufacturer and the patient consuming the drug. And they all maximize their revenue and profit by selling a higher volume of more expensive drugs. And so everybody in the middle, whether it's the pharmacy benefit manager, the pharmacy themselves or the specialty pharmacies, physicians like oncologists, hospitals, they're all taking a piece of the action, if you will. And it's a structurally inflationary system, which is why you get these crazy things that happen, such as We managed to, through Civica, a a nonprofit organization we helped found, to negotiate a $160 price for a drug, prostate cancer drug, that costs on average $3,000 a month in its current form. And it's a generic, so it's the exact same compound. So you get the exact same compound for $160 instead of $3,000. And we went to our then pharmacy benefit manager and said, isn't this great news? Let's go sell this $160 version instead. And they said no. And we spent five months trying to convince them to do it. And they finally allowed us to do it through our own special channel. Even just the last time I looked at the data, even though this $160 version is available to United Healthcare and a lot of blue plans and you know a lot of plans nationally, the $3,000 a month drug still has 90% market share. And, and the same thing's happening with drugs like Humira, who, they, which came off patent. There's a number of much less expensive biosimilars available, and yet it's maintaining a huge market share because this entire system is set up to drive more expensive drugs through the system and then take these really high list prices and take a chunk of that, take a piece of that, everybody does, before you get back down to the net price. So the motivation is to sell a higher volume of these more expensive drugs. And I said, there's just no way. There's no way for us to get to a more affordable, consumer-centered system when all of the incentives point in the other direction for the players in the middle. And so that's why we just said, start over. Let's just go directly to the pharmacy manufacturers and let's just go with You know, for each of the pieces of administration the pharmacy benefit managers do, we're going to pick who we think is best at that piece. So, for example, hard to imagine someone being better at delivering things to people's home than Amazon. Yeah, seriously. (laughs) What's enlightening and astounding at the same time, right? You know, for those who, you know, aren't there visibly in the day to day back and forth with a traditional PBM relationship. And at some point, you had to have given yourself permission to say, we are going to do something different here. And I admire the fact of how this did happen, even though it was conceived pre-COVID, because a lot of things didn't make that. I mean, a lot of things didn't keep going after that. And it's that thought of, we all understand the benefit of this. So how do we give ourselves that permission? Is there anything about that process that that is worth sharing just in, in terms of how healthcare is so relational. 
Uh, everyone yeah. wants to know who else has done this already. So that ability to give yourself the permission to say, ultimately, you know, we can point to to some estimated uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of cost savings in this case, you know, but there's something that gave you permission to to be able to say, we're, we're going to lead this. Well, it's about being truly mission driven and making that structural. So we describe our nonprofit mission as we're here to create a healthcare system that's worthy of our family and friends and sustainably affordable for everyone. So God forbid one of your loved ones has to use the healthcare system. First of all, they can afford the healthcare coverage and they can afford any co-payments that go along with it so that they can access the system. And then when they do, they're treated the way you'd want your loved ones to be treated at their time of greatest need. That's the bar that we've set for ourselves. And we're very clear about that. And we've actually put that into numbers. So we have, for example, benchmarked the total cost of our product, not just the premium, but the out-of-pocket payments as a percentage of median income in California. And we've set a standard for what quality of care, you know, the numbers we need to hit to hit quality of care, the numbers we need to hit for member satisfaction, et cetera. So we will have created a healthcare system worthy of our family and friends and sustainably affordable when we've hit all these quantitative goals. And then what it forced us to do is to say, all right, how do you get to those goals? And it and those goals were so much, so far beyond the way that we're performing today as a system that it became very clear to all of us, you just can't incrementally improve the current system. You've got to reinvent and reimagine it. And so it was really that structural tension, Jared, that we kind of inserted into our daily lives where we said, hey, this is our mission and we've taken it from prose to math. <laughs> and then when you start running the math, it forces you into doing things that other people aren't doing because it becomes really clear really quickly. Like I use the pharmacy example that trying to tweak a system that's that structurally inflationary where all of the incentives are lined up to go in the opposite direction um, is clearly not going to work. And that is one of the lessons I have personally learned, I would say, over the course of my career, which is you just can't fight self-interest. You systematically have to set up financial self-interest for the players to do the right thing. And then the right thing is going to happen more frequently. If you try to set up the incentives to go in a different direction and then push back on it, just it never works. Individuals and organizations are just incredibly creative and resilient when it comes to figuring out how to pursue their self-interest. So that's kind of how we set it up. And that's what I would say gave us, quote unquote, permission. It wasn't even just permission. It was a necessity. Like If you're going to achieve the mission, you have to go do some bold, aggressive, disruptive things, or you're never going to get there. Well, that gives us some real insight into the innovative direction that it, that it took to get to this point. And that also makes me wonder kind of what comes next. Is there anything you can share about where the organization is focusing for the next six to 12 months? You don't have to give anything away, of course, but what comes next? I mean, the fact is we've been working at the same things for a long time, Jared. We just haven't done them yet at scale. The one that kind of got announced at scale was really the pharmacy initiative. But the fact is, in addition to recrafting the pharmacy value chain, we're going to bring healthcare into the digital age. So what you are going to see within the next 12 to 24 months is members and their treating clinicians having comprehensive real-time access to all of their health information. And then being able to utilize that in different ways, like the prior authorization that I was talking about, like being able to settle and adjudicate all claims in a matter of seconds, weeks or months. And so bringing healthcare into the digital age can take a lot of the friction out of the system, a lot of the cost out of the system and improve the experience for members and physicians. So we're going to bring healthcare into the digital age. We're going to tie pay to value. By, by the end of this year, well over half of our primary care physicians are going to be on a pay for value system. And we're doing the same thing for specialists and hospitals. So this whole idea of you can't fight self-interest we're creating payment models that reward physicians for being efficient, for patient satisfaction, and for quality. And, you know, again, hopefully, if we give them the will to pursue that agenda and the tools to do it, then you start seeing some pretty big improvements in the system. And then finally, you know, creating a truly holistic, personalized experience for each of our members. And there's a lot of pieces associated with that, bringing in a broader set of data, which we're doing now. A lot of people refer to that as social determinants of health. 
and uh, scaling a program we call Health Advocates, who there aren't care managers, they're not nurses. They really, I call them like a, a family member for hire, which is like, what would you do if one of your family members, you know, lost their home or lost their job or needed an intervention because they were, they were addicted to something? You would pretty much do anything that you need to and drop what you need to do and, and figure out how to help them. And that's really what these folks do is they try to understand the life circumstances associated with people it may have to do with nutrition, home and housing, transportation could be a whole series of things that are important to their health and quality of life. So generally speaking, we've got a number of initiatives that we've worked on in pilots, but we're looking to scale across that broad spectrum of bringing healthcare into the digital age, reinventing the pharmacy system, tying pay to value, and creating a holistic, personalized experience. I love the order of those things. And I know that's not necessarily progressive that way, but the way you mentioned them is that all of these kind of lead up to a more personalized experience for the member, because that is what all of this ties back to, in my mind. So you know, a lot of the complexity that members, that consumers just aren't generally aware of all they know that is that it was difficult to engage with an organization or, you know, the industry or a, a doctor or a health system, whatever the organization is, all the person knows is that, that, yeah, that wasn't easy for me to figure things out. That I didn't have the information I needed. I wasn't sure I could trust this. And so when any of the advances and innovations that are being worked on, anytime those lead to an improved, simplistic simplified, more convenient experience, then that's what we cheer for, right? That's what we're we're hoping we can say all of this ties to and gets us to a, a better place. And that's what I'm hearing in all of this. The, the, the through line here is, yes, all of this leads to that more personalized experience. And that does generally mean the experience leads somebody to feel very differently. Because this was easier for me, I trust it more. Yes. And it's, and it's, as I said, worthy of our family and friends. I'm willing and I trust having my loved ones use this system because I know they're going to get treated that way. That's the kind of, that's the gold standard. I love that. So as a kind of like a final message here for, for those who aren't quite there yet. So I'd say a member or a consumer mm -hmm. that can include a caregiver, a family member, anyone who feels like they are struggling to navigate the healthcare system right now, that it isn't easy for them. What message do you have for them? There's hope on the horizon. So I would just say for now, stick with it. It's not necessarily going to all transform tomorrow. You're not going we're not going to snap our fingers and wake up and have all of these things that I mentioned, healthcare being completely digital, completely personalized. That's not going to happen overnight. There's just too much that needs to um, occur on the ground to make that happen. You should start seeing it getting better, a little bit better every day. You're going to start seeing some of those innovations. You're going to start experiencing less friction. So I guess what I'd say is don't lose hope or faith. Stick with it. I mean, you may need to be taking pages and pages of explanations of benefits and <laughs> putting them in paper files and manila folders for a little while longer here. but you won't have to do that forever. And so I think I would say, you know, keep the faith. There's change coming. Ooh, okay. That is awesome. I appreciate that. Again, just to know, just to hear that. Uh, we don't hear it often enough. And so it, it, it's a, that's an important message to share. Any final thoughts that we haven't shared anything we haven't discussed yet that you want to make sure we get across today, Paul? You can hopefully, you asked me about career advice at the beginning and I can't help myself but be passionate about this topic and, and it's probably highly perceptible for you and for anyone who's listening to this. And so, you know, hopefully there's others out there that feel like they can lean in. We need the best and brightest people doing their best work to truly get to this vision and this outcome that we're striving for. So I just encourage everybody who's listening, if you share that passion to figure out the place you can make a contribution, lean in, and don't compromise on the outcome. Well, it's been an honor to speak with you today. I appreciate you giving us your time. And with that, that's a wrap for this episode. I absolutely want to uh, thank you, Paul. I've had the pleasure of speaking with Paul Markovich from Blue Shield of California. Thank you so much for giving us so much to think about today. My pleasure. Thanks, Jared. 
Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. Tell your colleagues to tune in for all the awesomeness, then leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This show is produced by Shift Forward Health, the channel for changemakers. Subscribe to Shift Forward Health on your favorite podcast app, and you'll be subscribed to our entire library of shows. See our full lineup at shiftforwardhealth.com. One subscription, all the podcasts you need, and it's all for free. And remember, we might have a lot of work to do in healthcare, but we'll get there faster together. Thanks again.